Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Father, we stand again in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. And I just ask that you would take and filter out anything that's said that's foolishness, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you've been uh, following us in these uh, videos on Romans, uh, you know that we are now into chapter 4. Um, I've tried to not get in any hurry going through these uh, passages, and for good reason. And it's because there's so much more there than we could possibly, any of us, ever at any time see this is God's Word and in our last study together we had reached uh, chapter 4 what should we say what have we found Abraham our forefather to be according to the flesh for he was indeed justified by works and that would give him reason to boast, but he has no reason whatsoever to boast before God. Uh, I did a video devoted to that whole subject of boasting. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And now we're at the end of verse 3. Verse 4, what does the scripture really say? Well, it says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him. The word is legizomai, and that word is translated reckoned, counted, imputed. It's a bookkeeping term. It simply means to count it as true. Same word in the Greek language. It means to look at the facts and reach a conclusion based upon those facts. In fact, what's interesting about legizomai is it is apart from faith. Faith isn't required. And it, it is clear that Abraham was a new creation in Christ Jesus, or he could not have believed. And Christ made that clear in the 10th chapter of John. You've heard me speak on, on this. If you are not my sheep, you can't believe. If you are my sheep, you do believe. So, contrary to popular op opinion, belief doesn't make you a sheep. Being a sheep allows you to believe, and that is a clear scriptural principle. Now, it was declared that Abraham believed God in the 15th chapter of Genesis and many years later in the 17th chapter of Genesis. He was shown to be righteous by his willingness to sacrifice Isaac. And that's all that James was saying. I mean, folks, you can pick up and you can read a hundred commentaries on Romans chapter 4. In the grammar, we have the first class condition. The first class condition says, Abraham was justified by works, and he hath whereof to glory. And every one of those commentators will say, now, of course, this is not true. This is a first class condition assumed to be true. But it actually isn't true. And yet when they say that, one wonders what they do with James, who, who says clearly, James says, clearly says, Abraham was justified by works. Abraham was shown to be righteous by believing God. Abraham was shown to be righteous by working. That's clear. 
but that does not give him any reason to boast before God, none whatsoever, because God in his sovereignty has made Abraham a new creation in Christ Jesus. And the new creation does believe. My sheep believe me. My sheep hear my voice. So Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned unto him, reckoned unto him. It's the, the Greek preposition uh, ice or ace in the Greek, and it means unto, into, to, uh, it's translated as, or for, in my particular translation here, the King James reckoned unto him for righteousness in the King James. Now, I don't particularly like the word for. I don't like the word for. He, he really isn't righteous, but we'll reckon that to him for righteousness. And believe me, the, the modern theological position is that, and, and most of you are aware of this fact, is that you're not righteous. You're not really righteous. God just looks at you as righteous. And I am adamantly opposed to that position. Folks, God looks at you as righteous because he made you righteous. The problem is you don't see yourself as that, so you don't, you don't want to believe God. But we're told in Romans 5 that we were made righteous. We're told in Corinthians that we were made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, I don't believe God is mincing language. We were made righteous because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It isn't that we are unrighteous people, that God looks at us, he looks at us and he says, well, I, I know that they're unrighteous, but I'll look at them as righteous. And yet, that seems to be, well, not just seems to be, it is the modern theological position. You are righteous, folks, because God made you righteous through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so how righteous are you? How righteous are you? You were made the righteousness of God. In him. One of the Bible teachers I, that I respect more than I can tell you says, God made you a little bit righteous and he'll continue to work in you until you're finally made righteous. And I say, wow, that's, that's, that's a real rift on the friendship, but I'll overlook it for the moment just call it ignorance no I believe God made you the righteousness of God through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ now to him that works that's a that's a present tense a, pre, a participle, present tense, a middle participle. Now to him, to him works for himself. The pay or the reward, the wages are not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now clearly, that, that makes absolute sense. They're not reckoned according to grace, but according to debt. The word of in the King James Version, I don't know what uh, translation you're using, in both cases is kata in the Greek. Kata, and it means according. If, if you work, you're paid for what you did. If it's grace, then it's not pay. If it's pay, it's not grace. But to him that worketh not, Now, even as David describeth the blessing, 
Now, I'm, I'm going to get to that. It, it's the Holy Spirit who was the author, but David did the writing. I have no doubt that David did the writing. I have no doubt that Paul did the writing here. But as I've repeat, repeatedly said, the author is the Holy Spirit. And what we're studying in verses 4, 5, and 6, and 7 are from the 32nd Psalm. Psalm 32. It's astounding to me how many Christians seem to imply you know, that if God really wanted us to understand these words, he'd, he would have made it a whole lot more simple. I mean, have you ever bought a, a piece of machinery or, or a computer or, or anything that came with, uh, with an instruction manual? And you, and you read that instruction manual and you thought, you know, that manual's not very clear. I can't help but think that that's the way people talk to me about this book. We are studying the word of the infinite sovereign God. It's not man's conjecture, man's opinion, man's logic, or anything else. And it's miraculous that we can understand any of it. Why are we so willing to work so hard to get, you know, for example, advanced degrees in in mathematics, physics, law, you know, you name it, medicine or, or theology or any other discipline. And, and in case you don't like schooling that much, well, you can become an expert, you know, in golf or tennis or football or basketball or, or fishing or, or anything else. And every one, every single one, of those disciplines requires work. The training and the the discipline in any one of those professions is, is extremely hard. And all of a sudden, Christians want to be babied. It is work to study this book. And any translation any translation. I, I believe God has so guarded any translation where that properly used, it will lead you to the truth. Now, if you'll turn, you know, to the 32nd Psalm, I, I want to, I want to point out some things because they ought to bless your heart. One of the common questions that I get, and I and I used I used to think the questions I would get is, you know, is what does this word mean, or or what do you think that verse says? But I get I get other kinds of questions like, you know, well, Steve, why do you use the King James? Why do you use the King James version? Well, actually, I use, I you know, I the question ought to be why do you prefer it? I use others, but, and there are several reasons for that. One of the big ones is that I, I memorized a lot of it, and I was simply too lazy at my advanced age to try to memorize a different translation. I'm, I'm familiar. I'm very familiar with the authorized version, but that isn't the only reason. Another reason uh, is that the words for the, the Lord, for God, uh, for Christ, uh, you know, are carefully identified in the King James Version with capitals. There's another reason the King James translation was, was quite faithful in, in letting you know that there isn't any, uh, there, there's, there's not a word there. You know, it's one that they, the translators stuck in, and they want you to know that they stuck it in there. And there's a couple of reasons why that's valuable. And I have I know that in the past that I have mentioned this to you before. In the Hebrew, if you're talking about an unchanging condition, you don't need a verb. 
if you're talking about a condition that has change in it, you must have the verb in the sentence. Now, you know, in English, we have to have a verb in the sentence. Well, unless maybe you're, you're an okie like me, which sometimes that's not always the case. Our sentences, without that, they don't look very good. They don't look good without verbs. But in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, you are stressing to your reader that this is an enduring and eternal, unchanging condition. You just left out the verb. And boy, that saves a lot of words. And I mean, you could put the words in there. Now I want you to know that this is a never changing condition. This is always true. There is no change in what I'm talking about. But you could, you could do all of those words by simply omitting the verb in the Hebrew. That's what I'm that's what I'm trying to say. And David knew that. Now the Holy Spirit, I am certain, in, inspired him to write the 32nd Psalm. Psalm 32, 1. Look at the Hebrew. Look at it. The text literally reads, Blessed, forgiven, transgression, covered, sin. Five words. That's, that's it. Five words. Blessed is who? Blessed is who? The King James added the words, is the man. Uh, the is, the he, the who isn't there. Oh, how blessed blank. The translator said, we're going to insert a name. We're going to insert is he or or is the man. They, they filled in the blank. If Christ died in your place, you could put your name in there. And in fact, the word blessed is plural and means, the word means fortunate. That's what the word blessed means, is fortunate. If you're a Hebrew reading this, immediately you would ask, are, are there lots of blessings on this? And immediately you would understand, no, this is, this is the plural of excellence. Oh, how blessed blank. That's you. This individual who is in the blank has always been blessed. Oh, how fortunate. That marvelous blessedness that requires the plural of excellence. Never changed. Whose transgression is forgiven. There is no is there, folks. There's no is there. Your translation may have it, and if and if you have the authorized, it's italicized. Whose transgression is forgiven. Always was. Always was. Now David had to write that. And we know some of the problems in David's life. I know. You know, I'm not, and I, I know I'm taking liberties I probably shouldn't take. You know, David says, you know, well, Lord, do you really want me to write that? You really want me to leave out the verb? You know, didn't Nathan have to, to come? Something had to happen. In God's eternal plan, the transgression was always forgiven. There's no change in that forgiveness. blanks sin whose whose sin is covered but but there is no whose and once again the translators have pointed out to you that it is your sin it's your sin it's always been covered
There's no is there. Whose sin is covered? The verb's not there. And the word covered means that God cannot see it. It has always been that way. Now, don't get confused. I mean, oh, believe me, we were sinners saved by grace. I say that because God doesn't call us uh, sinners by title anymore. He calls us saints. There's no doubt about that. But God doesn't see the sin. It's always been covered. Blessed is the man. There's no is in verse 2. That man has always been blessed. Unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity. And in whose spirit there is no guile. There's no verb there. And yet, millions upon millions of sincere Christians are not only constantly preoccupied with personal sin, but they're actually striving to overcome that unchangeable sinful nature by opposite means of the blessing of, of grace God has bestowed upon them you know, which is law. Go to Romans 6, 11, the first commandment that you see in the New Testament is also you see the word reckon, reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ. Now one could possibly, well, David wants to put the verb there. I can imagine, you know, you know, there's got to be a, a change in the life when these things become true in God's eyes. They were always true. And the Holy Spirit is the author. I don't know whether David argued with God or not, or maybe David, maybe David knew these grand truths that that from God's standpoint, these things were always true. Maybe he knew that. Transgressions were always forgiven. Sins always covered. There is no guile in those who are God's. That's the new creation, folks, in Christ Jesus. That's the new creation, and yet we're in the Old Testament. This is one of the reasons why I use the King James Version. It isn't as obvious in other translations. And we miss the marvelous blessings uh, enlightenment, uh, graces in the Word of God. I mean, look down in verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Almost, almost every modern translation that I consulted, the art is not italicized. But it's a form of the verb to be, and it isn't there. He always was, and he always will be my hiding place. Not my money, not my job, not my family, not my friends, not my country, but my God. Always been my hiding place. There's one more, and that's in the 11th verse. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice you righteous and shout for joy all who are upright in heart there is no r there once again the verb is pointedly obvious from god's standpoint you have always been upright in heart and we wonder about grace the word grace is thrown around so loosely these days. Just, just in this psalm, the evidences of God's grace are, to me, overwhelming. It isn't that, you know, that I used to be a terrible person, and, and now by careful and diligent work between me and God, 
you know, we've worked together at this. I've become something worthwhile. Not true. Not true. Not true. I always, in God's sight, have been his child. And pretty soon, we're going to see that, that he justifies the ungodly. How in the light of that revelation of grace can I be ungodly? But you see, I have this treasure in an earthen vessel. I need to understand God's reason that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. And every day, it seems to me, I read articles or, or I hear sermons on the, you know, a radio, I'm listening to the radio in my truck, you know, on the excellency of the power, it ought to be of you. But the reason I have this treasure in an earthen vessel is that I might understand the greatness of the power is God's, not mine. Verse 4 of Romans then, in, in the fourth chapter, it is intuitively obvious that the one who works gets paid for it, or at least he ought to. And what he gets paid is reckoned by what he did. And that's, folks, that's common sense. It's been true uh, all down through history. Not of grace, but of obligation. Verse 5. But to the one that does not work, and that's a present middle participle, for the one who does not work for himself, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is recognized for righteousness. Now, without doubt, I believe that in the old creation, we are nothing but ungodly, and I don't believe that ever changes. The old man does not change. God's not trying to clean up the old man. We can say that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, or we have this treasure in ungodly vessels. They are vessels fit for destruction. We're going to see that when we get to the ninth chapter of Romans. Vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction. But God, because he has made us new creations in Christ Jesus, I don't believe you can establish a verse of scripture that, that says God has taken the old man, he's, he's cleaned him up, he's whitewashed him. Not at all. You're a new man. You people have put off the old man, which is corrupt, and put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Who did the creating? God. God created us a new man in righteousness and true holiness. The old man is corrupt according to the works of the flesh. It is ungodly. To him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned for righteousness. Now, now, you can read that, as most do, and, and you, you know, you're more than welcome, you know, to do that, uh, you know, that his faith then makes him righteous. That is not what the text says. I don't believe that you can take legizomai and say that it means that he was made righteous as a result of his faith. 
Legizomai, the word for reckon. Legizomai says, what is the, the, what's the logical conclusion of this? It is an action that can only be performed by one who is righteous. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom the God, that's the God, it's articulate, imputes righteousness separate from works. And that's what we looked at in the 32nd Psalm. And I read this sixth verse here in Romans. And I think there's David describing this. I wonder what David went through as he wrote those words, as, as he left out those verbs. I wonder if, if marvelous truths dawned upon David as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write those words. David describeth the blessedness of the man, and, and he did. The first word in the 32nd Psalm is the plural of excellence. Oh, the blessedness of the man unto whom the God, and there is only one God, imputes righteousness separate from works, reckons righteousness separate from works. We get count, conclude, and reckon, and impute with you know without work, separate from works. Saying, verse seven, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And I pointed out to you that when we looked at that the psalm, that the verbs are not there in the Hebrew, indicating that this has always been true of God. Blessed are they whose iniquities, that's, uh, that is anemia, no law, it's a compound word, the negative and nomia, law, no law. The Greeks, they indicate the negative of a word by adding the Greek letter alpha, alpha, alpha. I, I get the Navy in this confused. It's alpha. In front of nomia, no law, which is translated iniquities and whose sins are covered. In the Greek here, the, the word for sin is hamartia. Basically, the word means the inability to hit the mark. You can't even come near to hitting the target. But is there a difference between sin and iniquity? That's, that's the question, and that's difficult to answer. First of all, it says sins are covered in verse 7, and, and that is sins plural, and sin sing, singular. In verse 8, it's sin singular. Verse 8, I'm, I'm certain there's some reason the Holy Spirit uses the two different words. Blessed are they whose refusal for God's law are forgiven and whose sins, whose unwillingness to hit the mark are covered. That, I mean, that makes a lot better sense than trying to say, you know, that as some, I've heard some say, well, sin is worse than iniquity or, or vice versa. It's, it's really difficult for me to say that one is worse than the other. Because just, you know, even one of those would have put me in hell. I mean, it's the human folks that, that who makes bad sin and good sin. God didn't do that. God, didn't, God did not strike David dead for killing Uriah and committing adultery with his wife. But God did strike us are dead for trying to support God who really doesn't need support. You know, and that's, that's really always scared me because in, you know, uh, in many an argument, I hear Christians 
They're, they're trying to defend a God who doesn't really need defense. From the bottom of my heart, I, I declare this word does not need to be defended. What it needs to, is proclaimed. That's what that's what it needs. If the person is not God's sheep, I mean the atheist couldn't believe anyway, and and all the logic in the world would be a waste of time. If he's God's sheep. He can hear the word. Well, these these are not my words. These are words that came out of our Lord's own mouth. I'm not I'm not opposed to the study of apologetics. I'm opposed to the influence that people think it has. This is God's word. Sin is sin, iniquity is iniquity. The, the first word stresses the unwillingness to abide by God's rules. And the second is the unwillingness to hit God's target. But there's a great blessedness to those whose iniquities are forgiven. The word forgiven is a theomy. And in Colossians, all of our sins have been forgiven. That's charizomai. Um, a theomy is a different word. You find that in 1 John 1, 9. The two words, that's the two words that we look at for forgiveness. Charizomai is legal forgiveness. A theomy is, is many times spoken of as having to do with fellowship. It's uh, fellowship forgiveness. And basically, the word means to move aside. Uh, it means sent away, whose sins are moved out of the way. We find that word in 1 John 1, 9. That's, that's a fee of me. That meant a lot to David in the Old Testament. You know, for we had, the, we had the scapegoat. It was taken away to a foreign country to where nobody uh, could find that goat. And, and surely... The illustration was that the innocent died for the guilty and the sins were carried away. Carried away so that they couldn't be found. And that's the word here. They're sent away, moved aside, taken out of the way. Blessed are they whose iniquities are sent away and whose sins have been covered so that God cannot see them. Both of these are, are passive voices. It isn't anything that we did. God did it. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not, never, ever, ever, under any condition, ever, impute sin. Once again, the marvels of his grace spring forth from the text. You may look at uh, your life in total discouragement and you may be utterly amazed at some of the things that you do, you know, and you're supposed to be a Christian. And God says, never, ever, under any condition, ever, never will I impute sin to you. The word is reckoned. Isn't it amazing? that our God of grace and love reckons righteousness to us and will not, under any condition, ever reckon sin to us. I wish this video could go viral. I wish this, you know, people, but Look, you are new creations in Christ Jesus. You're not sinners who are saved by grace. You are saints in an earthen vessel that sins. But God will never, ever, ever reckon sin to you. Well, I'm out of time. 
Heavenly Father, uh, gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given us just to take and look at your word, to spend some time together in it. I just ask that you would filter out all foolishness, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.